Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today on our webinar about economic tools to promote climate change adaptation in the real estate sector. My name is Elena Chia, and we also have Jim Vanderwall here as part of the Fraser Basin Council. As I had mentioned before, uh, the audio options you have is to listen in through your computer or you can call in at the telephone number listed and there's an access code that you can use there. So this webinar is part of our BC Regional Adaptation Collaborative Program. Uh, otherwise known as BC RAC, and this program aims to support local governments, First Nations, and industries in integrating climate change adaptation into their planning and decision making. Uh, as part of BC RAC, we have our webinar series, we host in-person workshops, and we also have our retooling website. Uh, you can see the website on our slide, and it hosts tools and resources for adaptation planning, including case studies, guides, toolkits, videos, and more. Um, and BC RAC uh, is funded from Natural Resources Canada's Adaptation Platform Program, as well as the BC Ministry of Environment. And just to go over some webinar logistics, uh, we ask that you keep your audio muted to limit the background noise. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, you can do so through the question box on the side panel. Uh, or if you prefer to ask your question verbally, please just let us know and we can selectively unmute you. We will have our Q&A session after our speaker's presentation. So we'll hold off from answering questions until then. If you experience any technical difficulties through the webinar, you can let us know through the question box, or you can send us an email at FraserBasin at gmail.com. So today we're really fortunate to have Dr. Richard Boyd from the All One Sky Foundation. Richard is a recognized expert on the economics of climate change with 20 years of experience relating to the appraisal, design, implementation, and evaluation of both adaptation and mitigation programs and policies within all levels of government. He has significant technical expertise in climate change vulnerability and economic assessment methodologies, and he has written numerous research guides on the subject. Richard has also worked on climate change adaptation strategies for communities in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Canada, and he's led analyses on the economic impacts of climate change on human health, the built environment, energy systems, and water resources. And a bit more about All One Sky Foundation. It is a not-for-profit charitable organization established by the former Climate Change Central in 2010 to help vulnerable populations at the crossroads of energy and climate change. They do work on education, research, and community-led programs, focusing their efforts on adaptation to climate change and energy poverty. And the foundation's vision is a society in which all people can afford the energy they require to live in warm, comfortable homes and in communities that are able to respond and adapt to a changing climate. So at this point, I'd like to pass it over to Richard Boyd. So if you can bear with us for a few seconds. 
Um, hi, Alina. Am I um, on uh, on speaker now? Yes, yes, you are, Richard. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah. I, I thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, today, I'm, I'm going to give you a sort of high-level overview of a project that um, we uh, undertook uh, for the uh, Climate Change Secretariat of the BC Ministry of Environment. Um, and the project was also co-funded by Natural Resources Canada. Um, but before I start, I just wanted to acknowledge um, two other members of the project team um, who aren't speaking today. Uh, Jeff Sukuski, who's a professional planner in BC and a climate uh, resilience specialist that um, I've been working with now for a number of years. And Tim Pringle, who's a 20-year veteran of the, the BC real estate sector, um, both of whom made significant contributions um, to the report. And I'll just give you a quick overview of what we're um, going to talk about today. I, I want to start by looking at the objective of the study, um, then a little bit about the approach that we took, um, which sort of leads into a, a sort of overview of the real estate development process, then looking at some of the barriers to what we call some socially sound adaptation decisions within that development process, um, looking at examples of a few economic instruments that could be used to address some of the barriers that we identified, and then some of the, the main recommendations that we um, came up with um, at the conclusion of the report. The purpose of the, of the project um, is to uh, basically identify um, three to six uh, economic instruments that um, both the provincial and or local government in BC could use to promote adaptation to climate change in, in private real estate decisions. I mean, that was the, the sort of overarching objective of the project. Um, but before we go a little further, I think it's worth touching on a few sort of scope issues. Um, we were talking here, like the remit was to focus on decentralized decisions, that is decisions that um, uh, private actors would take and not and not to consider sort of more centralized choices like um, you know the public investment in in, in uh, like uh, engineered flood defense structures it's more about what does the individual homeowner or property manager um, do in response to climate change we're also the the remit that we got was to um, uh, look at this in terms of uh, social benefit so it's not about the, the private uh, uh, private individuals making decisions um, in, in their own best interest, but private individuals making decisions in the interests of wider society within within a climate change context. We were also advised um, to exclude uh, economic instruments that um, look to raise funds or to finance economic uh, or sorry climate change adaptations. Um, as those were being dealt with through through another study, um, and also to exclude um, looking at policy tools that um, compel adaptation action. So we weren't really looking at the sort of standard regulatory or um, planning tools. We were looking at more instruments that uh, change the costs and benefits, the information and incentives that. Um, private uh, actors in the real estate sector faced, um, but still leaving the choice up to them as to how they then process and utilize that information to make adaptation choices. So it wasn't about compelling them to, to make those choices. The other um, final point I want to make about the scope was that the, the study was an exploratory study. Um, and by that, I mean that we were looking at uh, trying to identify potential um, economic instruments that could be used to address some of the key barriers within the sector. Uh, a lot of these are were from, I mean, the approach that we took was uh, largely based on a review of the literature. Um, and so some of these uh, recommended tools are uh, theoretical um, and haven't actually been used in practice. But it wasn't the, the, you know, our job to um, look at every single detail about how we can go about um, implementing them. It was more about looking at identifying those potential um, instruments with promise that um, could potentially be developed further um, looking towards uh, ultimate implementation. 
Um, now I want to just talk a little bit about the approach that we um, took to the to the study. Um, and it did like the, it's grounded in this sort of concept of climate resilience pathways, which you can think of as trajectories for the real estate um, for real estate development in BC that combine adaptation and mitigation to reduce climate change and impacts in the long term to um, to, to realize sustainable growth. So we're looking at how the real estate development process can move along a climate resilience pathway. And how we sort of view this is the development process itself represents an opportunity space where a range of different private actors um, throughout the full development process can make choices. And those choices um, uh, can be in response to climate change. Um, and so the opportunity, like if you think about the real estate development process, um, in a climate change context, there's a lot of uh, various climate related impacts which presents threats and opportunities to this space. And in facing those um, threats and opportunities, the actors themselves at different points throughout the process, can, they can make choices. Some of those choices may involve um, uh, adapting efficiently to, 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 the, to the climate risk. Um, and some of those choices may involve um, what we call maladaptation, which can be anything from um, not a, not not responding um, to the risk at all, or maybe over responding, um, or under responding, and and therefore making choice uh, decisions that ultimately waste resources. And so, if you trace this through throughout the whole development um, real estate development process, and the different points throughout there, there's different actors who can again make different choices, um, either taking them on a more resilient pathway moving up towards the, the, the um, top right of the diagram there, or they can make choices at different points um, in response to climate change that ultimately leads them to a, um, a, a lower resilient or uh, a higher risk future. And that's the sort of conceptual framework that we were working with. And so what we wanted to do was identify, well, what are some of the climate related impacts that the sector is facing in BC. We wanted to um, develop uh, an idea about the real estate development process, look at the different actors at various stages throughout there, understand the barriers that they may face at the different choice points, and then look at economic instruments that could help encourage them to make choices at, at those points that led them down a more resilient pathway. And that's the sort of framework and approach that, that we adopted. The sort of opportunity space that I referred to above, um, or the real estate development process, there's various um, different ways of looking at this. Um, but the, the sort of one process there is, is shown in the diagram, and it's essentially taking, taking um, like, for example, here a single actor um, or consortium uh, big, uh, of parties could acquire land, um, they could hold that land um, for a while um, and at some point uh, when it was deemed economic proceed to the sort of planning stage, um, or early stage planning, um, sort of packaging the land up, making it ripe for um, uh, sort of horizontal development and at some point then proceeding through to vertical development, through to occupancy, um, operations and maintenance of the properties and through to um, uh, renovations uh, uh, at some point in the future and then ultimately to the point where there's some um, decisions required regarding redevelopment. And throughout that whole process there's some very high level decisions that are required um, and but there's also as you'll see there's a lot of sort of finer decisions and those um, decision points um, or where we are looking to sort of identify opportunities to influence the choices that the actors make with regards to their adaptation choices. And I've just got a few examples up there um, uh, of some of the um, opportunities for intervention um, at where decisions are, are being made by actors. For example, at land, the land banking phase when they're acquiring the land and um, there's the choice of sites that they, um, uh, they they select and purchase. There's also the the sort of uses for the site that they're contemplating. 
um, as you move through to the, um, the sort of development of the site, there's choices regarding the layout, choices regarding the, the design of the infrastructure. Um, and at the construction phase, there's choices over the sort of building design, some of the materials that are being used um, within the buildings, um, also some of the landscaping choices. And, and, and also in terms of, you know, um, marketing the properties, you know, do we disclose the, the choice um, or do we disclose the climate risks that are faced by the property? Um, and again, like looking down to occupancy, if you're in, in a situation looking at minor upgrades to the property, um, choices again regarding the, the, the sort of improvements or techno technological measures that you, um, that you retrofit to the property. And each one of those different points, um, like the person making the decision could choose an option that either enhanced their resilience to climate change or um, actually made, made the risk exposure worse or, or maybe did, did, didn't change the situation. So what we were looking to do was to identify all these um, decision points throughout the process and what we found that was that we came up with about 30 plus different points where we could look to apply instruments to sort of um, influence the decision that the different actors were taking. Uh, and another point that was coming up during this study was that also even at, at some of these individual points, um, for example, with looking at the, the choices people can make with, with respect to upgrading their property, um, uh, retrofitting uh, adaptation measures to there, there was um, a huge variety of choice that they could they could take, um, and to, you know even with regards to like flood risk, there's a range of different measures that you can take to enhance your resilience or resistance to flood risk. Same with regards to wildfire and some of the other climate related hazards, uh, and so we were in a situation where we couldn't possibly. Um, Look at to try and address instruments across the full range of different um, uh, decision points, and also with regards to some of the detailed measures and technologies and behaviors that individuals could could choose. And so, to keep this scope manageable, we we decided to to focus in on sort of three three areas across the development process, um, in which we could sort of look at the application of one or two instruments. Um, to sort of uh, at, improve the decision making at, at those points. And the areas that we chose were sort of during the early planning stage or land packaging. Um, was it possible to look at uh, an instrument that would encourage um, developers to uh, pursue at a more sort of socially sound level of adaptation within the sort of concept plans that they were developing? Um, and at the occupancy stage, looking at uh, is there any way that an economic instrument can be used to sort of promote the retrofitting of uh, climate resistance and climate resilience measures um, to the property? And then also at the sort of end of the development cycle when we're looking at um, a decision regarding the redevelopment of a site, um, whether or not there was uh, an, an instrument that we could use to sort of um, facilitate a process of managed retreat from there when it was judged that it was no longer viable to, to, to retain development with it at that site. And so we, the, the project really focused from here on on the three different, um, these three different areas. And so we're looking at who's making decisions in those areas, uh, what barriers they face, uh, and then what instruments could potentially be used to address those barriers. In terms of the, the, the barriers themselves that we were identifying, um, I think it's probably useful to try and explain what we mean by a, by a barrier. Um, and if you think about, with like, like the example here is like the, the individual who is making the decisions about whether to retrofit their building with um, uh, climate resilience uh, measures um, and which measures to, to choose. In an ideal world where like all markets are perfectly functioning, um, that individual would get information on the, for example, like the, the, the cost of the risk reductions um, 
the cost of the, the climate risks in the absence of the reductions. He would get information about the different technologies that could be installed, their price, the cost of install installation. He would also get the full information on the operating and maintenance costs. Um, he would get full information on the risk reductions that would occur from the implementation of those measures. And based on the, that full set of information provided by a perfectly function, functioning market, that individual would rationally process that and choose a level of risk mitigation that minimized social costs going forward. Um, now, the reality is that markets don't work perfectly well. There are a range of different barriers uh, uh, or market failures. Um, there might be externalities present, which mean that some activities um, uh, are, are undertaken more than, than, than is socially desirable. There may also be um, uh, you know, some information or technology um, goods may, may uh, exhibit public good characteristics, which means that they're underprovided. There may be asymmetric information um, within the market There's, um, and other different uh, reasons as to why the right price, sig uh, right price signals and the right information is not provided to this individual. But there's also, um, uh, in economics, there's this assumption that everyone is like perfectly rational and that we can take all the information we, we are given, function like supercomputers, and, uh, and produce very rational, sound decisions. Um, but again, the reality is that we are not perfect computers. We cannot process this information, um, uh, all of the information that we get rationally. We have cognitive constraints. Um, we also um, have another, or have other different forms of behavioral failures uh, which contradict the sort of standard economic model and what this means is that even if we were given all the right price signals and given all the right sets of information, we do not necessarily process that in a way that leads to the best choice. And so given that there's within the real estate market, there's a range of behavioral failures and a range of different market failures what we did was look at each of the case examples and try and identify some of the, the main barriers that the decision makers within each of those example areas faced. And I'm not going to read all of these out, but the main point I want to make is that there's multiple, multiple barriers um, facing decision makers at each point. Um, for example, the, the sort of salmon colored ones there are related to informational failures. The, the blue ones relate to um, it, it sort of imperfect price signals or economic information being conveyed. Green ones are related to behavioral failures and there's also some uh, existing policy barriers um, which will inhibit the uh, decision making. And as what we found is when we were looking at across the different um, example areas, each one of them, there was multiple, multiple barriers uh, at any one decision point. Um, there were various forms of imperfect information, multiple barriers that distorted the, the price signals um, and the incentives that the different decision makers were facing. There was also various forms of behavioral failures in terms of how they would process that information. Um, and also some uh, policy failures uh, like from existing regulation that created some perverse incentives um, which would inhibit the ability of, of the different actors to make the, the, the most socially sound decisions. And so what we were concluding, which I think is quite important, um, uh, is that in each of the different cases that we looked at, um, you really need to have an instrument mix in order to promote the, the sort of sound decision making um, with for the different actors. You need a mix of instruments to provide information. You need a mix of instruments that will also look at um, improving the, the price signals that we face. You also need help in um, uh, how that information is provided in the design of those instruments um, through um, different ways of uh, addressing behavioral failures and also need to remove some of the perverse incentives that exist through existing policy. And, and this led us to the sort of um, instruments that we um, 
uh, we're, we're working with, uh, or, you know, with, that we identified. Um, so we looked at the different barriers, knowing that we needed an instrument mix, and then and looked at one potential instrument to apply within each of the different um, case examples. So we looked at development cost charges uh, to incentivize uh, integrating adaptation at the early planning stages, um, looked at programs for property level upgrades to uh, increase the uptake of um, climate adaptation measures um, during um, the minor renovations uh, of occupancy, and then also looked at um, was there a role for tradable uh, or sort of transferable uh, development credits um, to support a program of managed retreat um, uh, during redevelopment. But then also realizing we need a mix of instruments, we looked at uh, mandatory hazard disclosure to overcome informational failures, which would support implementation of these measures um, in the other uh, case study areas. And then also what's referred to as choice architecture, um, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, later. And that was looking at um, how do you provide this information and how do you design the incentives to overcome the behavioral barriers that people face? And there was also a couple of, we found as we were looking through these case examples, some existing policies that needed to be um, uh, amended or, 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 or looked at further um, to, in order to support the implementation of the uh, other instruments. The, in terms of the existing um, uh, policies that, that were providing um, a disincentives uh, for um, adaptation. Two, two that we came across in the literature, um, one was um, the property transfer tax. Uh, and with the property and any tax on a transaction, um, like, the, like the property transfer tax, essentially uh, inhibits the, the number and volume of transactions that will take place in the market. And, and there's some discussion within the literature that the presence of this tax will actually inhibit people or reduce the number of people um, transacting on the market that otherwise would in the absence of the tax. And what this will do will sort of lock in some people who want to get out of a high-risk area. Um, it will uh, provide a disincentive for them to put the property on the market. And then there was also the fact that, um, that the tax applied to both land and improvements. And so there was also discussion within the literature that um, the fact that it applied to improvements as well provided a disincentive for people to implement risk reduction upgrades, which essentially enhanced the value um, of, the, of the buildings. Then there's also uh, looking at the sort of area of uh, managed retreat within coastal areas and when we looked at case example three there is also um, in the literature this discussion around this what's called a self-reinforcing loop um, of, of transfers that fuel growth within within high-risk flood areas and essentially it's like the safer it becomes to live in these um, sort of high-valued flood prone areas the more like the more we um, would like to live and work there, uh, and the higher the to then sort of the higher the total value of the risk becomes because there's more value and wealth at risk, and then the more pressure the government gets un and put under to increase investment in the sort of level of protection provided these areas, and also in t uh, in terms of paying out on the disaster uh, financial assistance. And then of course the more investment that's made in protecting, and the more um, provisions are made for the um, provision of disaster relief, then the safer it becomes and then the cycle just continues um, until at some point the, the risk in the future uh, becomes so great that the, the actual cost benefits of, of the infrastructure investments and protection um, no longer become warranted. And th this was considered a significant barrier to um, uh, managed retreat. And so then we're looking at uh, basically reforms to try and break this cycle. Uh, and one sort of policy that we found was um, the Coastal Barriers Resource Act in the states, which essentially um, shifted the burden from taxpayers onto people who wanted to still reside in high 
high-risk um, coastal flood areas. And that was a sort of form of like uh, economic instrument that could be used to try and break this cycle um, of continued um, growth within high-risk flood zones. And so those were two two areas that we identified that required um, uh, some form of um, review and potential revision in order to remove these sort of maladap maladaptation incentives. Moving on to development uh, cost charges, um, it, those are currently within the Local Government Act um, and used by um, local governments essentially to recover the capital costs associated with um, new growth um, and the costs incurred in the provision of the infrastructure and, and various services. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk in the literature about using or adjusting these development cost charges in order to promote smart growth um, with conservation goals in mind, greenhouse gas goals in mind, and energy efficiency in mind. Um, but there's also um, some t papers out there sort of suggesting that these charges could be modified in some way um, in order to actually incent uh, behavior um, towards uh, in, uh, reducing climate-related risks. And one of the sort of suggestions there was, well, ha why don't we have a two-part um, development cost charge? The first part of the charge does what it does at the moment, which is to basically recover the um, uh, capital-related investments or, uh, associated with um, growth for new developments, but then also to incl include within that a sort of risk charge, which is there to sort of internalize the external costs associated with climate change um, on the community over time imposed by that development. And, and, and the sort of idea is that the risk charge would vary um, along a risk gradient in much the same way as some of the char charges at the moment vary along a density gradient for the purpose of promoting smart growth. And, and, and in that way, um, if the developer were to uh, undertake um, or design the, the um, development to minimize risk, then he would pay less on the development cost ch charges. And the more risk to which the community was exposed to within the new development, then the higher the charge would be. And again, I mean, it's worth just stressing again that these are theoretical. They're, they're concepts that are found in the literature. Um, usually an extension of what's happening in another area, like smart growth and uh, and can it be extended to adaptation, um, but they're not, there's not actual practical applications of these instruments at the moment. With regards to the development cost charges, there were a number of other suggestions. Um, some of those were looking at, well, could you maybe stagger the payments, um, make, uh, put them into installments, uh, and in that way, um, uh, benefit um, developers by reducing their carrying costs if they undertook certain adaptation um, measures. Um, and then also, um, can, could the development cost charge also be orientated towards recovering the life cycle costs associated with new development as opposed to just the capital growth related costs? And also, um, some suggestions that could the assist factor there um, re representing the, uh, the local government's contribution to the new development uh, capital co uh, costs, could that in some way be um, utilized um, in, in order to promote um, adaptation by the by the developer in terms of um, uh, increasing the assist factor in, in cases where the developer was implementing measures that resulted in a lower risk development. The, um, uh, being a concept that, um, that's not actually in practice at the moment, there are a number of sort of challenges that have been identified. Um, one of them is relating to the sort of 
uh, reluctance on the part of local governments to, to make adjustments to development cost charges that might result in lower total revenues given the importance of these charges within the, the sort of total um, uh, tax mix uh, or revenue base. Um, there's also like clearly this um, there's going to be a fair amount of expertise and information required in order to create a practical development cost, uh, cost charge system um, within this context. Um, the administrative burden of managing the, 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 the development cost system as well. Um, and also there might be some potential changes to the legislation um, within the Local Government Act in order to make such a system um, possible. Just moving on to the, the um, uh, property level upgrade programs um, for the sort of occupancy stage of the development cycle. These programs Fortunately, there's a, a, a good analogy with energy efficiency programming that exists out there um, for properties and buildings at the moment. And it's essentially the programs that you would use for adaptation mirror the same programs that currently exist for um, energy efficiency, in which you would have some source of money, um, uh, e either, like, for example, provincial, provincial dollars um, and that were given to some form of administrator which might be um, at, at the local government level or maybe a provincial agency um, and then they design a program comprising a range of financial incentives, um, information uh, about the different risks and the benefits of addressing those risks that property level owners might face. Um, some technical information about the various options and technologies out there that could be used by these property owners to um, reduce risk and uh, also advice on how to install them and then also some marketing and promotion um, for, for the program itself and, and those are the sort of main, four main components of um, the, the offering of such a program to property owners and th this here would be one sort of instrument that packages up several different um, non-financial -incent non incentives and financial incentives for property owners to retrofit um, their buildings to en enhance resiliency to climate change. I mean the example that's up there is a, basically a, a grant-based or, or subsidy-based program which might be familiar with the sort of rebates that are offered by utilities for energy efficiency. Um, but there's also um, a, a, another more complicated version of this which would in, entail a um, loan-based um, program which just adds a few extra elements to sort of allow property owners to repay the, the loans um, and also to provide security to the, to the capital provider. But basically with regard to these programs, there's models out there from the energy efficiency world um, that could be adapted to provide the, the sort of climate adaptation retrofits at the property level. Some of the challenges that we would face with these programs would relate to um, sort of trying to quantify the, the sort of monetary benefit to um, the, the property owners. Um, within the energy efficiency context, this has proved very important in trying to convince people to participate in the program. And also it's a, a valuable input to sort of the selection of the different um, technologies and measures that you want to offer and also important in setting the level of financial incentives. So that, you know, you know, a challenge is can you actually quantify the monetary benefit to the homeowner from uh, uh, reducing climate related risks. Another standard um, part of the component de program design is that dealing with free ridership um, in terms of people who would install the um, adaptation measures um, regardless of the level of um, uh, incentives provided um, through the program. And then there's also might be some potential for inconsistencies with um, current parts of the building code or other bylaws um, that uh, weren't um, in favor of some of the technologies that were being um, suggested to enhance the property's resilience to climate change. Again, those would need to be explored. Another tool that we were looking at um, was the, um, the sort of tradable development credits. And 
there's discussion um, or suggestions within the literature that these could be used to facilitate a program of managed retreat. Uh, and they sort of work in combination with um, the sort of uh, zoning laws. And what they do is they allow the sort of ownership of the development rights on a, a privately owned piece of land um, to be separated from the ownership of the, the, the parcel of land itself. And then the development rights can be transferred from the property or like from a property in a sort of high risk flood zone um, to another property in a sort of lower risk um, uh, uh, area that's within um, the surrounding facility, uh, vicinity. Um, and the idea is that the, that the property from which the rights are sold is placed under some form of easement or other restriction which limits future development. And then the person who buys the rights, they um, have the option of using those to develop another piece of, of, of property more intensely um, than they otherwise would have in the absence of the tradable development scheme. And so essentially what's happening is you're shifting development from a high risk area to a area that has been deemed by local government as representing a lower risk area and one for which they um, uh, deem it also appropriate to increase the density within that area. And, and the system just essentially creates a program and that program creates a market for these transactions to take place. And the benefit of the, the sort of, um, this sort of scheme is that Normally, if you're if you're looking to try and um, f encourage or force people to leave uh, a high risk flood zone, um, you um, have to pay them, uh, you know, make payments to them, and that tends to be from the taxpayers. But with this sort of system, those payments don't actually come from the tax base; they come from other private entities who want to purchase those development rights so that they can increase the density to which they can develop. Um, within the, the receiving zone so that basically the financial burden rests within the private marketplace. Um, development credit schemes, they don't um, uh, function in isolation. They, um, for them to work, they also have to have be part of an instrument mix um, which basically helps the, the price signals within the market through the provision of, um, you need to also be providing information to the, the people in the receiving zone about the risks that they face. Um, and then also looking at removing, like I referred to earlier, removing that sort of perverse subsidy for this reinforcing loop of um, continued development within high risk areas. Both those things need to happen in order to, to create an efficient market for um, transferable development credits. And at the same time, you need to be able to impose restrictions on people within the sort of um, sending areas, within those areas of implementing hard armoring or other forms of protection on their own properties. Um, and then also, once they've left, you also have to have some form of policy tool which bans any new development within those sending areas as well. So that the market tool of the um, created through the development or transferable credit scheme also has to function um, with a bunch of uh, other uh, instruments and regulatory tools for it to be effective. Some of the challenges that are faced here, um, uh, again, it, it, this is something that has not been uh, applied in practice um, within this context in, in uh, Canada. Um, and so the, there's going to be issues around how complicated it is to design and implement. Uh, it, it's also because it's a system where um, private actors can voluntarily leave the sending zones or high risk zones, where there's sort of there's a lot of uncertainty around the sort of outcomes, like which property owners will actually participate within the program. Um, and because of that, it requires a fair amount of monitoring and ongoing analysis to, to, to sort of see how effective the scheme is being. There's also, um, like I was saying, because it's voluntary, you may not necessarily get um, the right people leaving the zone and at the at the the right times. And then there's also um, another sort of 
uh, key issue as regards to sort of whether there's because these schemes have been designed um, primarily within the context of new development, there's issues around how practical and, and what are some of the legal complications associated with trying to retrofit them onto existing development um, in, in terms of like facilitating managed retreat at the point in, at some point in the future. Just um, one of the other um, tools that we looked at was not necessarily about one of the individual case examples, but was providing um, support across the full range of um, the, the other instruments that we looked at and looking at specifically trying to address asymmetric information um, where buyers and sellers um, uh, would then, um, sorry, I'm just reading a little email here from Alina, okay. Um, yeah, where buyers and sellers um, have different information um, uh, entering a transaction and, and therefore it distorts the outcomes. The, the idea, this is an example of the, the, the um, disclosure tool within um, Oregon and it's just essentially um, at some point uh, when a developed property comes onto the market there is a um, disclosure form that's completed which documents the um, risks and climate related hazards that uh, that property faces and at some point during the transaction process that disclosure form is passed on to prospective buyers who then have an opportunity to respond to that um, and then also at the same time the prospective buyers are presented with some form of um, education or awareness that allows them to um, uh, understand the, the information that's provided within the disclosure form and the information itself can come from various forms of existing um, uh, like hazard maps or other information that's out there and also uh, it can be presented to the buyer um, either by the real estate agent or the, or the seller there's, there's different ways of presenting it and the idea is with this sort of form is that you are informing the buyer exactly of the full set of climate related or natural hazard risks that they are um, basically accepting when they go ahead to purchase the property. There's a, a, a range of different issues associated with um, the design of a, a disclosure system in terms of who prepares the disclosure statement, um, whether it's done by a third party consultancy, whether it's responsibility of the buyer, whether the real estate agent um, undertakes it. There's also issues with regards to the, which properties might be exempt and which properties um, uh, must be covered by, by the disclosure statements. The timing in the transaction process when it's disclosed, the, the source of the information, whether like some schemes the information must come from um, state or provincial sources or in other cases it's basically the best guess of the property owner. Um, the types of hazards that are covered, whether it's the full spectrum of climate related hazards or whether it relates solely to flood or solely to fire. And there's various other um, uh, different uh, elements there that um, would be part of the design of the sort of mandatory disclosure um, instrument. I'm just noticing the time here so I'm just within the report itself I'm, I'm skimming through this fairly quickly I'm at a fairly high level but there's a 160 page report which includes a, a vast amount more detail than, than what I'm able to cover here. Um, and so I'm just going to jump ahead here to the, the sort of last tool that we looked at, which again is a tool that supports um, the, the implementation of the other instruments and, and basically any sort of instrument that would be applied across the full development process um, because it's sort of it's focused on uh, helping the decision maker interpret the information that they are presented with and also um, orientated towards when you're designing economic instruments and um, there's a bunch of um, various behavioral anomalies that you need to bear in mind um, uh, that um, have been shown 
to reflect how people actually really respond in the real world and not in an economic textbook. And some of these um, different anomalies are listed down the left-hand side there. Um, for example, the, the messenger. Um, there's a lot of studies that show that we can be influenced quite heavily by who communicates information to us. Um, defaults, um, you know, the, the, the defaults that we are presented with can have a significant impact on the choices that we make. We are drawn to things that are um, very salient. Um, then the initial reference or anchoring points that we're given um, also influence the sort of value that we attach to different decisions. And there's a full range of various um, sort of anomalies and um, factors that we need to bear in mind when we're designing in instruments and when we're designing informational tools. And the section of this within the report is really looking at this sort of choice architecture toolkit, which is basically how you design um, and provide information to people and how you frame the decision-making um, sort of context. And just one quick example there, um, looking at messengers, like I was saying that um, we are more likely to act um, on a climate impact or adaptation information that's provided to us if it's provided to us by someone we deem to be an authority or um, who is perceived to be an expert or from, or from our peer group um, or someone that we like. And when you're designing, for example, like uh, an informational package um, or the provision of incentives, the idea with this sort of choice architectural toolkit is that you pay attention to these anomalies and you bear in mind some of the advice that um, is given and how you actually respond to those anomalies. And this will enhance the effectiveness of your economic instruments and also enhance the effectiveness of any information out, um, that's being provided to, to the decision makers as well. Um, throughout the, the report, like I was saying, this was an exploratory report, so it was looking at quite a lot of these instruments in terms of potential applications. Um, and so we, when we're going through this, we um, identified a number of recommendations. Um, this is just some of the highlights. And so we're talking about, like I was saying before, ref reforming some of the, the perverse incentives for maladaptation um, within the context of, of coastal zone protection. Also, the potential reforms to the, um, the property transfer tax so that it um, doesn't inhibit um, people leaving uh, high-risk areas or doesn't inhibit people undertaking improvements to their, to, to their property to enhance its resilience. Uh, looking at funding and, and designing a potential pilot program um, for incenting property level upgrades and buildings. I could say there's lots of frames, frameworks for doing that in an energy efficiency context. Can one be designed for adaptation? Uh, looking at the actual feasibility and, and, and actually relative merit of using development cost charges as both a planning tool to promote adaptation and also as a fiscal tool to which is currently being used. Then looking at um, expanding the um, Real Estate Association's requirements at the moment regarding the disclosure of deficiencies. Uh, looking at uh, expanding those to include potential climate related hazards and whether or not there's um, a merit in there in doing a sort of pilot um, uh, labeling program in much the same way that they're done for um, the energy efficiency of homes. And, and other recommendations regarding the disclosure um, of uh, natural hazard information, making that mandatory. Also conducting a feasibility study into the use of development or transferable development credits. Um, to the extent that it, a reasonable system could be designed that would be effective in supporting a, a, a program of managed retreat where that was deemed to be the, the best strategy going forward. And then also looking at producing some form of choice architectural toolkit or, or policy guide that um, uh, policymakers could use when designing instruments to promote adaptation. Um, both in terms of enhancing the effectiveness of the information and enhancing the effectiveness of any economic instruments. And I'm going to wrap up there. Um, I apologize to Alina for um, going a little over time. <laughs>
Um, no problem, Richard. Thank you so okay. much for our presentation. Uh, I see we have some questions on, from our audience right now. Uh, there's one first comment uh, from Chi Chan that this is super interesting, and another consideration is the liability of the seller if their disclosure is incomplete and an event occurs. Just a thought there. Um, and then we have a question from Jacqueline about, can you give an example of adaptation of a building versus energy efficiency? Um, for like, yeah, I mean, there's, if you're looking at um, uh, like fire smart, for example, um, there's a range of different uh, measures that are recommended there in terms of um, uh, fire resistant materials for the external or um, you know uh, envelope of the home there are also some suggestions with regards to the management of the the, the land um, in the surrounding area or, or, or on your property and how you can reduce the fuel that's available for um, fires and then also uh, various uh, equipment pieces of equipment that you could also um, have within the property, uh, again, uh, to reduce this sort of risk uh, associated with fire, like um, fire extinguishers or, or water water supply. Um, and then things like with flooding, you can have various forms of um, water-resistant materials um, within the home should water enter it. And then you could also um, look at various measures with regards to the openings like the doors and the windows in, in the basement um, which are designed to actually prevent water from um, entering the home um, in the case of a flooding event. I mean, uh, so there's various technologies that are available to address different um, climate-related risks um, at the property level. And there's an appendix, appendices within the report itself which documents um, uh, tens and tens of these different forms of uh, measures. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I have a question here from Judith. If you label a home a higher climate risk, there is likely a drop in property value. Um, have you thought about how you can handle this? Um, I mean, that's true, and that does happen. That's been the experience with the only full um, uh, mandatory hazard disclosure program operating in North America and California, they've observed that the property prices of higher risk properties goes down and similar properties in lower risk areas goes up. Um, but that's exactly what you want to happen. That's, that's the market then conveying to buyers the risk through a lower price. And, and that's exactly, you, you want the market to capitalize the risk into the price, and so that's exactly what you want to happen. The owner doesn't like it, but in terms of a policymaker, that's what you want. Hey, thanks for that comment, Richard. Uh, and a question from G. Uh, are there planned next steps for pursuing this work? Um, there are a lot of policy questions and trade-offs that merit further investigation. Yeah, I mean, I. I I, I, I think there, we don't at the moment have any plans to pursue it, um, but primarily because we haven't had time to, to, to follow it up. Um, and also the actual report itself is only publicly, publicly been made available now for maybe a, um, a month and a half, two months maximum. Um, and, but I, I think that because it was an exploratory study, um, it was just identifying potential ideas, or sorry, ideas with potential. Um, and, you know, I, I raced through some of the main recommendations, but there's quite a lot more within the report. And I think at some point it, it would be worth pursuing um, and maybe prioritizing some of those recommendations and taking them forward. And it would hopefully, um, you know, the, the Climate Change Secretariat and in, in, in Ministry of Environment would be um, interested in doing so in, in conjunction with other um, stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, we have one question from Nikki. From your perspective, how do you see climate risk being determined? Do you see this as being the responsibility of each local government, 
or a professional at each property or should, or should senior level of government provide guidance? Um, I mean, I, I think that there's different issues there. I mean, I think that the actual risks that a community faces are local. And so you need, the, the information that is provided needs to be um, fairly localized um, because of the, the, you know, the, the actual hazards and the vulnerability of, of, the, of real property is going to be very location specific. But then the question is, should that be the responsibility of the local government to provide that or the provincial government? Um, and I would lean more towards the provincial government um, it, because of the, the sort of public good nature of the types of information that would need to be provided um, in that, you know, they're not going to be, they're, they're going to um, need to be provided with, with, uh, at, at the, I think, the provincial level because of the sort of economies of scale and the provision. Um, Thanks, Richard. I realize that we're running over time right now, so I'll just ask one last question. Um, and I apologize to those of you that we aren't able to reach, but we can follow up after our webinar. Um, so this last question from Jenny. It might be difficult for some governments to obtain the political will to implement some of these measures. Can you provide examples of how other governments have obtained the political buy-in to implement them? Um, I mean, I, I, the honest answer is no, I, I don't have that information to hand. And I think that one of the things I was emphasizing throughout was that a lot of the, the suggestions, uh, or sorry, the instruments that we covered are actually on paper. They're not, they're not found in practice. Um, at least within Canada, and I, so I don't think there's a lot of examples about the sort of the political economy of trying to implement them and understanding that. I, I don't think that that exists at the moment within Canada, and it's not something that we looked at. Um, you know, like for example, the process that the California government went, went through in coming up with its mandatory program. We didn't, within the scope of this study, look at that. But I would say like within the recommendations when we talk about looking at the feasibility of these instruments, I think the political economy of their implementation would need to be um, a, a significant part of the actual studies. Okay, well, thank you so much, Richard. And I'm sorry, I know we're running out of time now. So for those questions that we weren't able to address, I can follow up individually once we're done. Um, and yes, thank you so much for your time, Richard, uh, and for being with us here this morning and presenting on your work uh, in a very clear um, and effective way of a lot of dense information. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, and thank you to our audience for taking the time out of your work day to listen in. Uh, we will be posting up a recording of this webinar on our website and YouTube channel within the week, and I'll be sending an email to follow up with that. Um, if there are any other questions or comments, uh, feel free to get in touch with me at Elena Chia at echia at fraserbasin.bc.ca. So thank you.